What is up, Pro Guides family, and welcome back. I missed you guys. I've been climbing the ladder recently. Hopefully you've been doing the same. About a day ago, I went on quite a bit of a losing streak. And so I asked our challenger coaches on Pro Guides and said, hey, what am I doing wrong? They said, you are doing seven things wrong that all these pros are doing, which you're probably not doing, at least not doing well enough. And so I came up with the idea, why don't we put it into a video for you guys and see if that helps you guys on your climb as well. I put these into practice and I just saw my win rate increase a lot. And for our question of the day, which character in League of Legends mostly resembles your best friend? This could be physically, this could be personality wise. For me, my best friend Kevin mostly resembles a Moo Moo. Hopefully none of you guys know my friend Kevin so you don't share this with him because he doesn't want to know that, but he definitely gets salty, especially after a loss. Let me know who your best friend resembles and let's get into the video. The concept of strong side and weak side is applicable as soon as the first minion waves clash. When thinking about strong side and weak side, the core idea here is asking yourself, where is my jungler? That is so, so important. Ask yourself this, if my jungler is bot side, does that mean that top side is the weak side? This is how you should be thinking. The ebb and flow of the strong and weak sides of the map is what dictates how the laning phase should be played out. This logic is also applied in competitive games and remains just as important in your solo queue games at home. Let's take a look at an example. If you're playing top lane and your jungler decides to split the map bot side, playing in your red quadrant and the enemy blue quadrant, the enemy jungler will reside in your blue quadrant and the enemy red quadrant. In this situation, you must play more passively in order to avoid getting ganked or tower dived, while your team secures advantages elsewhere. This is why you'll see many tanks picked in competitive games as they succeed with less resources than most carry type picks. The exception of this is Gangplank, who has a strong kit for weak side solo laning and it scales really well into the mid to late game. On the other side of the coin, if the jungler is on your side of the map, you can do almost anything you want, whether that be deep warding, securing objectives, or general lane pressure. This often applies to carry top laners that can run away with an advantage, like everyone's favorite ranged bully, Jace. Since it is the year 2020, your foresight should be perfect vision. There's absolutely no reason that any of you guys should be dying to level three ganks. Three minutes into the game, when we reference tracking the enemy jungler, we mean understanding where their starting camp is and deducing the resulting route. At lower levels of play, think diamond and below, most junglers take a linear path after receiving a leash from their bot lane, meaning that they will almost always end up on the top side of the map. As a top laner, you can take advantage of this by stacking the first three minion waves and taking a 1v2 fight with your minions, dealing massive amounts of damage in the early game. In the situation where you don't have that level of lane control, it is instead best to fully crash the second wave and go for a tri-bush ward while waiting for more information on the enemy jungler's location. This vision and information sets you guys up for how to play the next minute or so of the laning phase. At the 3 minute 45 second mark, once the top lane scuttle crab is dead, junglers usually reset and path bot side toward their grop camp, giving you a general idea of the enemy jungler's location. In professional games, this information often impacts how players approach the laning phase. In some cases, junglers might even opt for the element of surprise by going for an off the wall play to score a cheese gank or a couple of kills. Though this doesn't really happen at lower levels of play where people do more or less the same thing every time. And this is just a piece of advice for anybody who's in gold or lower. What's really helped me actually is just choosing champions that are very easy mechanically so that my eyes are glued on the map. All of this stuff that we're going over over right now is not really that relevant unless you're actually looking at the map and taking all the information into account. So playing champions like, if you're in the mid lane, Malzahar, or, or in the jungle, a Mumu, champions that you don't really need to focus on the micro so much, but you can just spam your abilities to wave clear or to clear the camps, those picks are really gonna help you focus on the map. And that's what this is all about, macro level play. Okay, so on to the third one. We're gonna be talking about push vision, push execute. So push vision, push execute is a League of Legends concept that is applied to every role from the very second that the first minion waves meet. Basically, if you're able to push, then just 
push, and then you prioritize vision while clearing enemy vision, setting up the next minion wave push with full vision control. At the end of this tedious process, you execute a play with your current vision setup. Execution in this situation is what truly separates the good players from the bad. This can be a bit complicated, so let's break down three different game scenarios where this concept can be applied. Okay, let's start with the early game. Let's say you're playing Caitlyn and Morgana versus Ezreal and Tom Kench. In this situation, you have natural lane priority and can push the wave. Ezreal is a single target damage dealing champion. Morgana, well, she has wave pushing abilities. Same with Caitlyn. Ezreal and Tom Kench, they don't. So in this situation, if you are Caitlyn and Morgana, you have lane priority naturally because you can push that wave really fast. In applying this strategy, you should place two control wards in the tri-bush and the river bush, while also playing a trinket over the gromp wall and near the scuttle crab. When you have this level of vision control, you have a variety of execution options. You can either hit the tower and start chipping at turret plates, take the dragon with your jungler, or reset and then do it all over again. Though these are definitely the best options given the ideal scenario, there are a few things you have to keep in mind while executing these actions. While playing the vision game, you have to consider whether your side of the map is the weak side or the strong side. If your jungler is on the top side of the map, it's probably best to avoid going for deep vision. In this situation, it will usually be safer to place your trinket in the scuttle area instead of on top of the gromp camp. Okay, but what if you're on the weak side of the map? So, if your bot lane, if they're really, really aggressive right now, you're gonna have to be like, whoa, okay, why are you being aggressive? Honestly, if you are on the weak side of the map, that means you are most likely getting ganked, so you have to run from that scenario. Because why else would they be aggressive in that situation? Always ask yourself that. Okay, now in the mid to late game, your team is simultaneously pushing top and mid, while your jungler and support hover in between both solo lanes. Your team groups and pushes for vision while the enemy reacts to the crashing wave. You sweep and place control wards in their top side jungle and immediately go back to pushing both side lanes again. At this point, the most obvious play is to start Baron and bait a response from the enemy team. There's that, but there's also the big brain play where you sit on pinks and have the enemy team waste their vision resources, blue trinkets, yellow trinkets, and control wards, or just kill them as they face check into your team. In the event that they don't take the bait and just use vision resources, you rinse and repeat the minion wave pushes and river war until the Baron is yours. Okay, now let's go into our fourth concept, which is pushing or freezing the wave. Resetting is usually pretty simple. You go for a reset when you can push a wave without the enemy team being able to freeze that wave. Though minion wave management gets a little bit more advanced if the enemy team takes bad trades or even dies while the wave is still pushing towards you. Let's say both you and your support are low on health and mana and cannot push the upcoming waves fast enough before the enemy champions come back with fresh resources. The first thing you should determine is how many minions are in the enemy wave. You generally want to shave it down enough so that the enemy minion wave has three to four more caster minions than your wave. If this is the case, you aim to quickly reset and purchase boots to get back even faster. If you don't shave the wave enough, you'll probably end up losing a few minions to the tower, but it's important to keep in mind that if you end up shaving the wave too much, the wave could actually push toward the enemy. This situation is a case-by-case -case scenario filled with several nuances. The learning curve is relatively steep compared to other game elements, but once you get it, you really, really get it. Wave management tactics are heavily rewarding once you understand how they work. We do have some courses on pro guides about wave management, but if you are having trouble with this, there are a ton of challenger coaches who will help you understand this completely. Okay, now let's go into our fifth concept, which is understanding support roam timers. When a support is looking to roam after a fresh reset, they should always look at the minion wave's position bot lane. If the wave is pushing towards them, they need to calculate the time it will take to roam and return bot lane. This is important when it comes to anticipating a potential tower dive on their AD carry. If you are the support in this situation, be sure to ping your ADC to play safe under the tower, sacrificing gold and experience to stay alive. If the wave is frozen or pushing toward the enemy, the support cannot roam and should instead stay bot to try and break the freeze. This way they can naturally break into that push vision, push execute cycle that we talked about. When it comes to support roams, junglers should look to coordinate multi-angle ganks with their support, primarily around the mid lane. 
In this situation, the mid laner is ideally baiting aggression or trading aggressively for lane priority. If you're the mid laner and the enemy support is roaming toward your lane, you should play safely as your bot lane pushes their minion wave back toward the enemy tower. Once that pressure builds up on their side of the map and the support is forced to prevent a tower dive, you can resume normal pressure. Okay, before we go into our sixth concept, I do want to talk to all of the people who are gold and below. If you guys are in those elos, it is really, really hard to not be frustrated. I used to get so, so frustrated at my team because sometimes someone would maybe even leave, someone would get upset and you know, the whole, it would be very toxic. I think maintaining a very, very positive attitude and just focus on yourself and how you can get better and how you can influence the map will eventually be way more satisfying. So you won't feel so toxic. You don't have to engage in the negativity. Just focus on yourself, see how you can influence the map and get better. That really, really helped me. And that's not part of this video, but you guys should definitely be aware of that. Okay, now onto our sixth concept, how pro players break freezes. This one is really important, guys. So what do you do if the enemy bot lane is freezing the wave and you can't actively contest the wave? Well, you have three major options here. One, you have your jungler help your mid laner get lane priority so that they can both roam down to the river, giving you the space to actively push the wave and break the freeze. If the wave is built up enough, this also creates the option for a 4v2 tower dive. Depending on your champion, this could go really, really well. Sometimes it could go wrong if it's not coordinated properly. So just keep that in mind. Okay, number two, surprise, surprise, this involves your jungler again. They'll typically be your ticket out of situations like this. Imagine relying on your jungler though. Start the dragon with your jungler and have him come bot afterward so that you have the space to break the freeze. His presence should give you the necessary push to get the wave back in order. Number three is gank mid with your support and pray to Lord Faker that it works out. At that point, hit the mid lane tower until the enemy bot lane starts pushing the wave again. You might lose out on some gold or experience or just a bunch of time, but if your jungler is feeding, this might be the way to go. It's important to be flexible about these situations though. If at any time their bot lane breaks the freeze, be ready to adjust your plans accordingly. If they start pushing the wave the second you leave, double back and pick up that wave immediately. If the enemy bot lane concedes lane advantage after the roam, forget about the dive, just take the reset. All right, guys, now onto our final thing that pros do that you probably don't. And that is how pro players set up dives. The most basic way to set up a dive is to stack two to three minion waves and zone the enemy so that they can't clear it, eventually crashing the wave when the jungler comes from behind to seal the gank. Here's a good way to visualize this. If you are playing Jace against Maokai and are able to fully zone him from the minion wave, you solely last hit in order to stack the first and second wave. Once the third minion wave makes its way in, you start pushing to get the wave under their tower. In an ideal situation where your jungler path from bot to top side, this should be an easy tower dive on a fairly weak early game champion. The minion wave density gives you the space to make for a quick and easy gank where neither of you should die to the tower. This logic can be applied to any lane at any time of the game. Lane priority is king and makes for safe and effective plays with little downside. In the event that the jungler can help the mid laner get lane priority, or they just naturally have lane priority because they have so much wave clear, you can start setting up three or four man dives depending on the side lane. In situations without the mid laner, the top laner can also teleport bot to make it a decisive four man dive. Teleports can also be used defensively to dissuade the enemy from trying these types of ganks on your own bot lane as well. That's it for our video on seven things that pros do that you're probably not doing in your games. Just take these tips, apply them to your gameplay, and watch your win rate skyrocket. I know you guys are gonna do a great job this ranked season. All you have to do is just keep grinding, keep getting better, just have that winner mentality, and you guys will get it. If you guys want to connect with me on my Instagram, feel free at Christoph Pro Guides. I do some updates. I'll let you guys know when the live classes are up with Zyrene. And if you guys want to get better at League of Legends, you know where to go. Go to ProGuides.com and go find your challenger coach today. All right, guys, that's it for the video. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck in your next few games.